to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma. Good afternoon, Dee, or I should say good morning this time. Yes, we're doing morning instead of our use. I have a story to tell about last week's podcast. Oh, really? Go for it. What? Well, I talked about all the tomatoes I'd harvested. Yes. And, and then my sister was driving about three hours away to visit a friend, and she decided that she'd listen to the podcast. So I get this text that she hadn't gotten any of my good tomatoes, and she didn't understand why. She hadn't had Uh-oh. any good tomatoes this summer. Uh-oh. And this is the sister I've met, right? Yes. She doesn't really garden. She doesn't garden. She lives in a condo. And so, you know, on Monday when she was back, I hot-footed it over there, and I left her a bag of tomatoes. Yeah, that was smart. She called me later and said they were they were delicious, she said. She had forgotten how wonderful homegrown tomatoes are. Yeah, they're the best. And um, by the way, let me just say, living in a condo is not really an excuse for not gardening because you can garden in containers. Well, and let me tell you part two of the story. Ah. So part two of the story, she calls me and she says, "Um, can I grow herbs in my sunroom? Now she has the sunroom I want. It has west and south windows, and it is sunny like 40 hours of the day. In Indiana would be a good thing. In Oklahoma, that would be hot. But yes. Well, it still can get hot, and she has blinds that are closed all the time, and it's still bright and sunny in there. So I said, yes, you could probably get away with it, but you'd have to open the blinds on the (laughs) south side. Yes. Because she loves basil. And then she said, the... Earlier this spring, I'd helped my other sister get a big raised container on legs so she could do some gardening on the deck. Right. So she saw that, and she thought, I want one of those. So I bought one, too, just to try it, and I'll probably give her mine next spring, and we're going to plant basil in there and all kinds of other herbs, and she's going to love it. You know, I, she wants to garden, D. I won one of those containers this year off of Instagram, and... um I need to put it together, so I'll do that, and we'll all grow in our, you know, big, tall containers next year. Right, and so I'm excited because we always laugh and say that she's the sister that doesn't garden, but she's starting to want to plant a few things, and she sees the benefit of, you know, basil, not hard to grow, Mm-mm. outside especially. So I'm going to get her all set up next spring. I think that's awesome. That means we actually influenced one new person to garden, which, you know... One. There we go. No, actually, my, my best friend, right. my non-gardening best friend, is doing just a titch of gardening herself. And she's really proud of herself. So, good. you know, let's just say this up front. You can garden at any level, and you're a gardener. You don't have to be crazy like us. We're crazy? Well, we're just a bit touched. Hey, I have a quote for the day. Hey, go for it. Let's get on with our flower. Texture and foliage keep a garden interesting through the season. Flowers are just moments of gratification. That's by Kevin Doyle. That is very good. And flowers are gratification. Yes, and sometimes That's things don't sure. flower in the summer because, you know, it's too hot. So you've got to have some good foliage. But that's not what we're going to talk about. Well, we are a little bit. We're going to talk about one thing that has to do with foliage with our, our group of plants that we're going to discuss. Yes, and so I enter this conversation with some trepidation. Why? Because we're going to talk about a plant that is not entirely hardy here, but those who are desperate, which are usually people from the South who have moved here, can grow it as a shrub. Yeah, here it grows as a shrub and a tree both. It's, of course, the crepe myrtle which is Lagerstromia indica. And um, there's another subspecies of it, but most everyone grows indica. So um, there are trees and shrubs here in Oklahoma. In fact, I have two very, very large ones in my lower garden. But occasionally, because it gets cold here in the winter, sometimes they freeze all the way to the ground. So they're half-hardy. 
Yes, and here they are definitely half hardy, and I would expect it to grow to die back to the ground, and so I would almost call it a woody perennial. Yeah, I can see that. I can see it being a woody perennial where it's a tree here. Um, you you said that these are often sold in front of the grocery store in Indiana when in bloom. Yes. What weird. Um, so most plants are sold in bloom, as you and I have discussed, because a uh, a crepe myrtle shrub is just a bunch of leaves to most people. Although they have some that have some dark red leaves that are really really pretty. Yes. But so they come into bloom around August. <laughs> and so they put them in. <laughs> they put them in the front of the grocery store where they trap you. Well, because oh, that's pretty. Well, I've never seen a flower like that. Well, that's what I think is weird. Because I'm from Indiana. I think it's weird because they sell them in front of the grocery store, not that they sell them in bloom. And here they start blooming in July, and they bloom from July all the way to frost, pretty much. Now, you can buy them at the garden center. But I don't know that the garden centers push them as much because they are not completely hardy. Right. And so some years they're going to be really great and you might actually lose it. But I do, in defense of crepe myrtles in Indiana, I know of two that I have passed. One is another sister, the house catty corner from them. They have a large shrubby crepe myrtle in the front yard. Mm Mm-hmm. And I don't think it gets a lot of special care because I don't think that a gardener's been living there for what what direction does that face? That faces uh, uh, east. 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 It's getting so it gets morning sun. Morning sun, and also I think it's getting uh, a fair amount of, of southern sun. It's kind of on the southeast corner of the house in the yard. Okay, so it gets warm enough and it has some protection, which is why it's still living. And there's another one that I know of, and it is on the, also the east, no, it's on the west side of a house, but kind of out in the middle of the yard, so it gets a lot of sun, and I don't know if they're protecting it, but I've seen it in bloom in August. Several years. Hmm. Interesting. Well, in Oklahoma and south, you know, parts of the south, in fact, the whole entire south, Crepe myrtles have been a real boon to gardeners, and I grow them in probably the most northern area that they will still grow as trees. And mine are really old. They're like 25 years old, the two that are trees, well, three that are trees. But occasionally they do die all the way to the ground. So I'm just going to tell Oklahomans and anybody who's in the middle south that if they do die all the way back to the ground, just cut all of that wood off, use it as stakes in your vegetable garden, and then grow them again as shrubs, and then eventually train them up again as trees, because I've actually done that. In 2011, we had um, a negative 25 degree temperature one night because we had a bunch of, I think, well, actually, I think it was negative 11. That's right, negative 11, not negative 25. That'd be too cold. But anyway, it got into the negative numbers pretty far because we'd had 24 inches of snow. That just hardly, I mean, that's only happened once in my lifetime. But they did die all the way to the snow line. So it can happen. The other thing I was going to say is grow them in full sun. In Oklahoma and everywhere south grow them in full sun. They have always been rock hardy, great plants that you just can't kill until recently. And recently we're having a little bit of trouble in Oklahoma. And it's something called crepe myrtle bark scale. And it wasn't a big problem for years And they have it a lot in Oklahoma City. I haven't really seen it out here. Um, But I did some research on it because at my last uh, talk I gave, people asked me about it. And I was dumbfounded because I hadn't heard of it before. And it's really bad. But it's like the same, it's not the same creature, but it's like scale that you get on citrus trees. And scale that you get on magnolia trees, deciduous magnolias. Um, It's disgusting. I hate scale. Don't you hate scale? I do, and I've had magnolia scale on a star magnolia Ugh. that I have, and um, yeah, it it's they look like little shells all over the branch, and then right. they they secrete a sugary substance as they eat, and then a black mold grows on that, and so you just look at it and say, this is a terrible mess I've got to take care of. But the good news in my case is I've conquered the scale and it doesn't seem to be a problem now. 
or nature conquered so how did you, I did how did I do it yeah um, how did you conquer your scale on the magnolia well what I did was I sprayed it with uh dormant oil they call it it's a horticultural oil and it tends to suffocate them and if you get them at the soft stage when they can it can suffocate them if you wait until they're like hard shells for forget right. about it there's nothing you can forget do about it so that's what I did. So this is similar. This type of scale is similar. And yes, it has, and I would advise anybody who has a uh, crepe myrtle bark scale to go do some real research on it because it's complicated because like other types of scale, it has a hard stage and a soft stage and a gooey stage and ugh, I hate them. Um, I'll just tell you what I've done. So everything I saw in research said that you needed a systemic pesticide, which gave me the chills because I don't, systemic pesticides kill everything that they come near, in the soil, above the soil, in the plant, in any plant nearby, anything that comes and visits that plant. Now, there's a lot of people who will tell you that pollinators don't visit, um, don't visit crepe myrtles, but that's not really true. Some of my crepe myrtles, um, I definitely get very, very small hoverflies and very small bees on my crepe myrtles. So right. I don't want to kill those. Um, and I don't like using, you know, systemic pesticides because sometimes they last a while in the soil. So what I do with my citrus trees, because I raise citrus trees in my greenhouse and I get scale every year, I actually scrub the scale off. And there was some talk at this talk I gave, among, and it was for master gardeners, and there were people there from the extension service, and there was a big discussion about using power washers or because you need something really strong to get the scale off. Right. And so they were discussing using power washers and doing it that way or scrubbing it with um, like a like a scrubby brush thing. Um, because here's the deal. And it's pretty easy for citrus trees to get scale off. I mean, it takes some work. But they're small trees because they live in Oklahoma and they don't really want to live here. These other trees, mine, some of mine are 30 feet tall. So... It's a little, it's a little more complicated. Um, if I get scale, I'll let you know what I do. But for right now, I'm going to try the power washer method if it ever comes here. I pray it does not. But usually, if something's going around, it eventually comes out here, even though I'm pretty isolated. So that's enough of talking about scale because it grosses me out. Let's talk about picking the right crepe myrtle for your um, property. That is key to growing them in Indiana is you have to pick a variety that is hardy enough, at least root hardy. And I found that the, the Dazzle series is supposed to be root hardy to like 6A. So even people that are north of the city, I'm south of the city, people north of the right. city, you could probably just ignore this next part because I just don't really think you're going to have much luck the further north you go of Indianapolis. I'm like at the southern, I'm at the northern end of the crepe myrtle as a woody perennial that dies to the ground range. And the Dazzle series is Yeah, I grow cherry Dazzle. I, you know, I can't say anything about it being root hardy because I haven't had a freeze like that except that one time. Um, but it is a great little plant and does really well and it's considered one of the smaller ones. Um, here, the reason you pick the right crepe myrtle for the right place is so that you don't have to do as our friend Steve Bender from Southern Living Magazine says, um, the grumpy gardener, he's, he calls it crepe murder. And there was this thing for a while in my part of the world where they just kept cutting crepe myrtles back to these weird stumps. And then they grow these great big kind of wounds on the bark. And yeah, they flower, but they look bad. And you don't want to have to do that. So when you're at the nursery, if you're around the South, look on your phone and figure out which variety, because there are so many varieties now, pick a variety that is the right size. Don't plant them under power lines. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff to remember. So pick the right size, because they do get large here, 30 feet tall, like a big tree. Can you believe that? I, I believe that because I have been uh, to the South and I have seen the crepe myrtles as actual trees. And one thing we should comment is, as a tree, they have stunning bark. It's beautiful appeals. In my opinion. Yes, mm -hmm. beautiful peeling bark. And I think that, especially in the wintertime, is a great feature for any tree to have interesting bark. Right. And they, they peel, the bark peels, and then it leaves this beautiful 
underbark, which is one of the reasons the crepe myrtle scale is freaking people out. Um, one other thing we want to talk about, we briefly mentioned the dark purple leaves. The Black Diamond series um, is a really great series because those leaves are almost black. I have some with dark purple leaves, but not the black leaves. I will say if you grow those, at least in my state, um, grow them on a south, ex a southern exposure um, or grow them somewhere where they get a little protection because I have received some specimens of those and they have not overwintered in my garden. Now, they have overwintered in my priest's garden because I put some in front of his house and um, it's a south facing, you know, southern facing exposure and they've done really well there. And they're beautiful because I think his are black with dark pink blooms, that particular one. And I think they actually have a red, a red bloom now too. So, Well, and I have actually purchased Black Diamond, and it, I think it was going to live through the winter. Mm -hmm. But I, and this, is, this goes back several years ago, but I had some guys come, and there were two large shrubs I wanted them to take out, and then this other shrub. And I tagged them all, and then this black diamond crepe myrtle was kind of sitting in front, and they ended up taking it too. So, oh. you know, it, it might have made it, but they, they pulled it out, and I thought, well, that's all right. I'll try again someday. It's just a matter, like you said, of finding the right spot for it. And that's true whether you're in the south or up here in the Midwest. Location, location, location is important in real estate and also sometimes for plants to make sure that they have a go at it. And one of the things we've learned from traveling all over the United States is that certain plants do much, much better in different locations. And it can almost make you think, you know what, I don't really want to plant something here that doesn't do well here. And what I'm thinking of in particular is forest grass, Japanese forest grass. I have, I have killed a lot of it and I have a lot of it that's stunted in my front garden and up in Chicago and also in the Pacific Northwest that stuff grows in huge clumps. And once I saw it in its happy habitat, not its native habitat, but its happy habitat, I went, okay, I probably don't need to grow this. That's Hakanakloa. Yes, and I have some, and it is not great, but it's still there. It's still surviving, which does remind me also, I forgot my oldest sister has a crepe myrtle in her garden that she purchased while she was on vacation because... They were somewhere where they saw the crepe myrtles in bloom, yet they were pretty. So they brought back one from Virginia, I think, from a mm -hmm. nursery. So it's going really well. And her daughter lives in New Orleans. So if my niece in New Orleans is listening or husband, and they listen to this podcast quite a bit, you can grow any crepe myrtle you want down there. No kidding. <laughs> Whatever. Anything they do. you want. You can have any crepe myrtle, any color, any size, go for it. We also have a really, really famous uh, crepe myrtle. He wouldn't call himself a breeder. He would call himself someone who makes selections, and that's Dr. Carl Whitcomb and his son, Andy. And they, uh, they've bred many, many great crepe myrtles for the market in Oklahoma over by Stillwater. Um, I grow three or four of his in my garden. One tall one is Red Rocket, has beautiful red foliage, I mean red blooms and darker foliage. And then I also grow tightwad red. And I probably grow a couple of those others, but those are two I remember off the top of my head. Oh, and I think he also did pink velour. So he, some of his, I'm going to say breeding, some of his breeding or selection has really furthered crepe myrtles to where they're now easier and easier to grow. Have we talked enough about crepe myrtles? We have, because if we talk much more about it, I'm going to end up going around town trying to find some crepe myrtle to grow, and I, I just really don't need that right now. I got you enough stuff that? to worry about in the garden. <laughs> no. So we should move on, because we have another quote, which would probably send me right back to trying to grow crepe myrtle, but read <laughs> that next quote, D. If you've never experienced the joy of accomplishing more than you can imagine, plant a garden. That's by Robert, and I hope I don't say his name wrong, Brault. Um, I don't know who Robert Brault is, but that is the truth. That is. And so, yeah, getting a lot of crepe myrtle to overwinter would be more than I can imagine. <laughs> I already got my figs. I already worry about figs all winter. I don't need to worry about crepe myrtles. Anyway, let's talk about vegetables. Let us talk about vegetables. So in the garden right now, 
I am picking tomatoes, a few cucumbers. Uh, there's peppers that are just begging to be picked. Um, I've got overgrown beets, overgrown Swiss chard. <laughs> I've got onions that I need to pull. So the garden is starting to actually wind down a little bit. Mine is not, but it will be in about three weeks. It'll start. Yeah, you're you're about that far. You have that much more growing season than I do. I think I really have about a month longer than you do. When do you usually get your frost in uh, Indiana or your freeze? Uh, the typical first frost date or freeze date is October the 10th. Okay, so not that far apart. Ours can be like October the 20th, but sometimes we can go on into November. But then, of course, the daylight gets shorter, so things don't grow anyway that well. But we're not really talking about summer gardens today. We're talking about fall gardens and starting your fall garden. Will you do a fall garden this year? You know, I want to do a fall garden, but I just have so many things on my list that right now the main thing I've got to focus on is the plants that aren't producing, I really need to pull them out and um, decide whether they are compostable because there's no disease or insects or whether they go to the trash because there's disease and insects and most of them go to the trash. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of focused on let's keep this thing clean. Let's get the weeds out of here so mm-hmm. I can start thinking about um, a clean palette for next spring. But I do want to sow some vegetables, but it's probably going to be a little bit before I get to it. Yeah, and it gets complicated because there's a window, and I, I I don't know how hot, I don't know when it starts to cool down in Indiana a little bit, but like right now in Oklahoma, um, it can get really, it's really, really hot. It's like 101, 103, but I've noticed our forecast is starting to cool at the end of this week and on into next week, which is good news, and we're starting to get some rain. So the complicated thing here is, you know, if you put out lettuce, if you tried to grow lettuce right now, it it would be a little early. When you do, if you want to sow seeds directly in the garden for lettuce or spinach, um, I'm going to suggest that you get some really good shredded leaves and sow the lettuce seed. Get those really, really wet and nice and cool, and then wait for a cool day. Put the lettuce seed in, especially a cool day if we're going to get some rain, and then it might come up. Or what you can do is start those lettuce or spinach or any other type of crop like that indoors, and then you can transplant them outside. So there's different ways to do that. Um, It's just how much trouble do you want to have? Now, for things like radishes, they have a short season, so it's easy to grow those. And you can just pick your day. It is. Point out the, the reason you want to cool the soil or do this inside is lettuce seed, will simply not germinate when it's hot. It just sits there. Because it's, it's like, no, it's too hot for me. Which is how I feel about the garden in summer. Like, I don't work very much in it in the summertime when it's 103. Because even the earliest morning temperature is 79. That's still too hot. I mean, that's, Yeah, that's pretty warm. That's pretty warm to get started. and then. But if I do get started in the morning, then sometimes I can go on through the afternoon like I did last Saturday. Um, turnips are pretty easy to grow. Beets are a little harder. A lot of things won't germinate. But the thing about turnips is um, you can sow them as seed in various ways and then cover them. And then they may not germinate in the fall, but they might germinate really early in spring. I've had that happen before, too. In your neck of the woods, in my neck of the woods, they're just going to freeze. They're not going to come back that spring. Isn't that weird? I think it's, it is weird. I think it's weird. I I do know that some, uh, like carrots, and I think probably turnips and parsnips, although parsnips should have been planted a while ago. They're long. They become they become more flavorable, flavorful after a frost. That's true. And so they they can stay out in the garden. So if I decide to do a fall garden this year, I'm probably going to do lettuce and spinach, and yeah, lettuce and spinach. I'm probably going to do uh, lettuce, spinach, and radishes. I'm going to see what I can do. Yeah, maybe. But I think I'm going to do most of them in the raised garden bed that I, or the raised garden container 
instead of out in the garden. Yeah, and I have some cold frames where I do a lot of this stuff in the fall and winter. And they sit on asphalt, um, an asphalt driveway. And so they get all the warmth from that asphalt. So they stay warm. And then, of course, they're covered. Um, and so I do pretty well in those. And they're right by my greenhouse. I'll, I'll put up a picture on Instagram. In those, I do, I do lettuce really well. I do spinach really well. I've done carrots. I've, I've grown carrots all winter and then harvested in the spring. Um, I've done radishes and I've done turnips. But, um, and I had another thought of something else you could grow. Oh, kale. I do really well with kale. Definitely yeah. kale. And kale in the winter is better than kale that is planted in the spring because it is cold and it's sweeter and it also isn't buggy. And that's the number one thing about fall gardening into winter, which is really just winter harvesting. No freaking bugs. Oh, that and is. I'm sick a- of bugs right now. Yeah. Yeah. Bugs are, we're going to do a whole podcast on bugs later. Uh, we're going to do a special gosh, episode. the bugs, the, yeah, it needs a special episode because right now Oklahoma is at its buggiest and I'm telling you, bugs are everywhere. And I, you know, I like bugs to some extent, but there are certain bugs I do not like. Oh, same here. The other thing I was thinking about yesterday, uh, it was decent in the morning. I could have gone out and done some gardening. But then I decided to go to the bookstore instead, which was lovely. And then a big thunderstorm popped up in the afternoon. So I was thinking about August in the garden. And August is really not a peak gardening month for me either. I mean, I'll go out and do some weeding. But it's kind of like I'm not planting anything because this isn't a good month to plant. And I'm really kind of waiting for the coolness to come back to the garden. I'm waiting for September and in September, you know, then I'm going to like pull out weeds, clean stuff, Me cut too. stuff. I'm really going to go at it. But August, you just live with the fruits yeah. of your labor from earlier in the summer, whatever that turns out to be. And you read books, especially if you're in a hot climate, because you need something to do that isn't gardening related. So you can read about gardening or read about other things. So speaking of things that are not gardening related... You did something not gardening related, but it, as always, became gardening related. So <laughs> it led to gardening, yes. Tell us, I'll do the quote and then you can tell us. Ready? Ready. A garden, you know, is a very usual refuge of a disappointed politician. Accordingly, I've purchased a few acres about nine miles from town, have built a house, and am cultivating a garden. Alexander Hamilton. Tell us what you did, Dee. <laughs> we went to see Hamilton. It finally came to Oklahoma City. The Chicago company did. And I I can't tell you how much I loved it. But there's a particularly, and I don't want to give anything away for, you know, for anybody who doesn't know about Alexander Hamilton's life or about the play. I kept wondering why this musical was so celebrated. And then I saw it and I realized that it is such a powerful, powerful musical, but also it's almost all music. So it's not like a musical movie where, you know, they just break into song. They sing most of it. And there was a scene in it where it talks about him walking in a garden. Um, and it's in a music, it's in a, it's in a music part of the musical that's called It's Quiet Uptown. So if somebody wants to listen to that, it's on YouTube and it's the New York company on YouTube. Um, a very poignant song, but it discusses him walking in the garden. And I thought, wait a minute, I didn't know Alexander Hamilton was a gardener. I just knew that he uh, signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, I knew that he was a founding father, but I didn't know too much about him. And And I also knew that he created our first bank, our first national bank. So I knew he was a federalist, and that was about it. Now I feel like I just love him, so I'm going to read um, the biography that is about him that the play was based upon. But also, I pulled out a book I already had, and it was called Founding Gardeners by Andrea Wolfe, and you have this book too. I do have that book. Yes, indeed I do. He, um, he actually had a quite extensive garden, and after he decided to retire from political life, 
he, there's a really famous thing on both the Old House Gardens blog, which Old House Gardens is that bulb company we've talked about before, um, but they referenced a letter from Hamilton and a drawing for his gardener in upstate New York at his home called Hamilton Grange. And he was really interested in a fruit, veg, fruit and vegetable garden, which of course he was because that's how they ate. But he also directed his gardener to plant native plants and ornamentals. So if you want, we're going to link to this in our show notes, but the article is in Magnolia, which is the Southern Garden Histories newsletter. And I was just so surprised to find out that he was that interested in gardening. All the best people are, D. All the best people are. <laughs> True that. So anyway, if you can see the show, I've already told you, I'm telling our listeners, if it comes to your area, fork up the money for the tickets and you will not be disappointed. It's a beautiful show, teaches you a lot about history in a very interesting and fun way. And in, in addition, they're just so doggone good. Yeah, and I'm going to, I'm going to, on your recommendation, I'm going to check out if that show it may have come to Indianapolis and escaped my attention, but I'll see if it's going to come back around. I hope it does. I hope it does. I have a feeling it'll be touring for a long time because it was in New York for a long time. So let's end on a high note. I know something new came out and we're very excited about it. We are very excited because my children's book, The Christmas Cotton Tale, came out right before the holidays last year in paperback. And I've just published it in hardback. And so it is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can order, ask your independent bookstore to order it for you, which I would prefer. Um, and then today, sometime this afternoon, the truck is going to pull up and my copies that I'll be able to sell from my website will be available. And I can put on my website that the Christmas Cottontail is going to be in hardback, which I know some people prefer for little kids. So I'm excited. Right, because... Right, because if you've ever read to little kids, little kids want to read it over and over and over again, and you need a hardback so that you can have it survive their um, babyhood, trust me. And um, one more thing about fall vegetable gardening, there's a whole section on that in my gardening book, the 2030-something Garden Guide, which you can also buy online, um, and you can buy it at some local bookstores. I know they can order it in. So. And we'll we'll put a link to the 2030-something Guide to Gardening. We'll put a link to that on our show notes as well. Because, really, you don't have to be 2030-something just interested in gardening. And Dee's book is the place to go to get some really good information. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Carol. And we are also linking to Andrea's book because we both enjoy all of her books about our founding fathers. And uh, Founding Gardeners is another good one. Yes. All right. Well, that was lovely, Dee. I enjoyed talking with you over the garden fence today. It was great fun, as always. Let's tell people where they can find us, which is everywhere. So you can subscribe to this podcast, and you probably have if you're listening, on iTunes, Spotify, um, wherever fine podcasts are hosted, we are there. You can find us on Instagram as The Garden Angelist. Dee's out there as Red Dirt G Ramblings. I'm out there as Indie Gardener. Find us on Facebook, The Garden Angelist. Uh, email us at thegardenangelist at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from listeners. Uh, tell us what you like. Send us your questions, and we'd be happy to address them in future podcast episodes. Yes. So you can find us almost anywhere. And thank you all so much for listening, and it was great talking to you. Kelly. All right. Bye now. Bye.